we'll get started. It's about that time. So welcome everyone to uh, prime time at the Buckley University Library. We're so glad you're here. My name is Christina Cheers and I work in the Office of International Studies. And today we have Annie Wenzel with us um, to share a little bit, about, a little bit about uncovering injustice in India. Um, but before we welcome her to the podium, I'd like to remind you that um, prime time at the Bethel University Library is an ongoing series for the Bethel community that highlights the academic work our community is doing, whether here or abroad. Um, Annie's presentation is co-sponsored by the Office of Campus Programs, International Studies, and the Friends of the Bethel University Library. And for those of students here in the audience, um, I'd like to remind you that the library has a research prize, um, a re library research, library uh, research prize, prize uh, uh, offering, I guess that. Um, the winner will receive $250 cash prize for your research that uses library resources. So there's, um, if you're interested in learning more about this or, um, or submitting your, your paper, uh, you can get more information on the library website. Um, the deadline is February 1st, so start your research now. Um, next Tuesday, or, I'm sorry, this Thursday, October 21st, Andy Johnson from the Psychology Department will be presenting on MVP Programming, a Bystander Empowerment Model to Address, address Gender Violence. Um, the Mentors in Violence Prevention Program is in its experimental stage at Bethel this year and has been funded by Bethel students. So be sure to tune in this Thursday for that. So uh, without further ado, I'd like to welcome Annie to the podium. Thank you. Welcome. Um, I studied abroad in India last semester in the spring. I studied through BCA, um, Brethren Colleges Abroad, and I'm a studying teaching English as a second language. The um, program that I went with was actually a social work program, so a lot of what we dealt with was what was going on um, and what social workers were encountering when they went into the field in India. Um, so when I was considering where I wanted to study abroad, I couldn't get India out of my mind. Um, India always kind of intrigued me, and I didn't know why, but I think the um, how BBC kind of portrayed India as being this glamorous country with lots of um, diversity and colors, and like, it was very exotic. And, um, and so when I thought India, I knew it was poor, um, but I also thought of a place that looked a lot like this, and this is India. All these places are in India, um, so I'm not doubting that. But the reality is that most of India and the people in India live like this. Um, and that's what really struck me, that I was not prepared for. Um, I wasn't prepared for beggars to come and sleep on my doorstep. I wasn't prepared for um, women to try to hand me their kid. Um, so. About, there's about 14 million people in Mumbai, for example, and 8.4 million people live in the slums. Um, the slums don't have a place to put their waste. There's no toilets. There's no, um, the income for these people are, is obviously very, very low. Um, and so disease is rampant. There's no health care. It requires, there's just, the, number of problems just accumulates like you wouldn't believe when people are living in such terrible conditions. And when they're in such conditions, they're not going to school, then they're having kids, and they're getting married when they're maybe 14, and then they're, you know, it's just like it's this never-ending cycle that you can't get away from. Um, so, let's see. So like for example, in Mumbai, there are 17 public toilets for every million people. <laughs> so this raises a problem, as you can imagine. Only a third of the city has clean drinking water. We walk around Bethel and we just stop and take a drink of water like, oh of course. But it's not really of course for the rest of the world. Um, and I know it's hard to put that in perspective when we haven't seen it for ourselves, but that's the reality, unfortunately. <laughs> So this is the group I went with. Um, I was with four other American students, all from different universities. This was our program director, Shanti Lobo. Um, 
and she was there to you know to always talk to us to help us process she was a counselor herself um, but I actually found that talking amongst the other American students was really the most helpful we lived together we ate together we slept together we went to internships together we did everything together and we never once had a problem so it was really a blessing um, God I think totally orchestrated that so that it was um, yeah because I couldn't have done it alone for sure and then the, the random guy is our driver <laughs> who was the best driver out of the whole time <laughs> I always talked about him did you have a same so, driver no every day was someone different but he was, he was so sweet he was always like oh yeah I'll take you there and the other drivers would be so, what were we dr oh drinking um, yeah, it's called tender coconut, and it's fresh coconut down in the south, southern part of India. There's coconut trees everywhere, and so um, yeah, they, with a machete, you cut it open and then you drink it. And, and it's um, it's actually a natural coolant for the body, and in India, you need that. <laughs> that is for sure. Okay, so I um, was in the state of Karnataka. Um, well, I was just here on the western coast in Mangalore. Um, so within my state, one of my goals when I went into it was to learn some language. Um, so, but my friends from Mumbai spoke Hindi, and my friends from Kerala, which is this state, spoke Malayalam. My friends that spoke to their other friends from Mangalore spoke Tulu. If they spoke with people from Karnataka, they spoke, um, Canada. And so, and then in English, or and then in school we spoke English. So I was confronted with about five languages within like maybe an hour even just being in um, India. So needless to say, I didn't learn any language. <laughs> and, yeah. Um, but it is the land of a lot of people, a lot of different people, a lot of variety. You can't really say this is how India is because it's so different. Um, every state, every region has its own traditions and culture and language and way of doing things, um, different dress, all that stuff. But one of the things that I saw everywhere, I only went to like this part of India, but everywhere I went, the ground was very, looked very tired. Um, and I just remember like, just like having like the dust on your feet every day coming home. Um, it's just something that you don't ever we don't ever even consider washing our feet when we come home, but that was just the joy of the day. So, um, one of the things I you're surrounded with is Hinduism. About 80% of the country is Hindu. Um, now, about 11% is Muslim. So, these are this was one um, Hindu festival that I went to. We were actually the only tourists there because everyone else is there to actually worship the gods so that was an interesting experience but um, these guys are believed to embody the gods and so you can see people going up to them um, and they're kind of giving like goodwill and um, yeah so these these men are actually just like have a normal day job but they do these kinds of temple practices um, let's see. So here was Hinduism um, in like just daily life. This was a girl that I met um, when we were out at tribes. They have a little oil lamp here and they're worshiping this tree that's coming out of this stump. Um, just like the whole rebirth um, belief. Um, this was in um, someone's home. They have all these pictures of deities. You can find those on the streets. And oftentimes they adorn them like with flowers or, um, and they worship them with incense. So, and then um, Ganesh, that's this Hindu, this Hindu god, um, is very popular. I don't know why he's so popular, but everyone loves Ganesh. Um, this was another Hindu festival I went to. It was obviously a production because of so, so many people were there. Um, and this guy ate, drank the blood of live chickens, which is traumatizing. <laughs> <laughs> and he drank seven of them, so it wasn't just a one-time thing. 
Um, okay. So this was my interaction. Um, this is just celebrating Kola, which is in a, is a Hindu festival. Um, when we went to the temple, we uh, kind of, I, if you guys have questions about that, I can talk to you about it later. But the two mark is the sign of going to the temple on your forehead. And then amongst Hinduism, you still have the inner culture of um, Islam. And um, you're encountered with that, too. So. Um, I'm a firm believer that as Christians, we have responsibility for social justice. I don't think that that's like a questionable um, thing. <laughs> I don't know why the church, like the church hasn't um, done as much about that as we are called to do. But, so that's why I'm going to focus more on the social injustice that I saw, just to raise awareness. Um, because I think a lot of people in this country don't know, and it's not that it's their fault or that we just don't know because we don't have it around us, but I think it is important to know about and to do something. Um, so I studied at Roshni Nalea School of Social Work. This was our classroom. Um, very simple chairs with pieces of wood that we sat on, or that just kind of laid on top, and then open windows, no AC, no heat, nothing. Um, fans, hopefully. The electricity was working. Um, so these are the three, three classes I took. These are some of the things that we covered. Um, and then we also took three excursions to Bangalore. Goa is just north of the state of um, Karnataka, and then Kerala is just south. Um, and yet, has a lot of great laws and legislation has been passed in the recent years, but there's very little enforcement, which makes the laws not as important or um, respected by the community. And so by Indian law, for example, children are not allowed to work under the age of 14. They're not allowed. It's like 16 in the States. It doesn't happen. But no one enforces it, so it does still happen. Um, there are estimated 50 million child workers in India. Um, you can't even comprehend that number, but it's the reality of <laughs> the situation and what um, we're confronted with. So this was um, one of the main things that we covered was the reservation policy. This policy says that 27% of all government institutions are anything that is supported financially by the government 27% is reserved for this weaker section of society, what was like the lower caste. Um, there's about 1,300 castes that are considered lower. And um, and so, but, but then there's this big controversy about it because it's, well, it's not equal. Well, no, it's not, but it, um, people, but if you're not educated and you, you're, you know, you're, you've been impoverished your whole life, you need help getting, getting up or bringing up your status. Um, so the cons to this, though, is our people are like they're faking what caste they're in so they can get a job, or um, they're saying that it's discriminating towards the upper caste. And the upper caste, if they're educated, why is someone that is not as educated or not as um, prepared for this job, why are they still getting the position over them? And so it's it's very controversial, and this is a protest. Um, I didn't witness this protest, but um, yeah, it's a, it's a very hot topic, especially with um, just those that are educated, because <laughs> they don't like it in general. Um, so this was just, this is like the tribal area. Um, in terms of the reservation, um, the, how do I say this? Like there's been kind of a sense of entitlement now because a lot of these lower castes have been given food and housing and their basic needs are met and that's happened for about 50 years now. And so now they're kind of just happy with, you know, I don't need, I don't want to move up. And so that's been a huge problem and um, alcoholism is playing really large part. I was told that 99% of 
tribal men are alcoholics. <laughs> like, you don't find anyone that's not an alcoholic, which is really sad and um, is affecting the communities, obviously. Um, but at the same time, I'm a firm believer of working hard doesn't mean you're going to be successful. I saw people that hauled bricks for 14 hours a day, and they'll do that for their wife and their kids. They'll stop, work, they'll stop going to school when they're 12 or 14 to do the same thing. So working hard is not always the answer to the solution. Um, so when we were on our excursions, we went to different NGO sites. Um, one site was in Goa, Swift. It was a laundry service that employed victims of prostitution. Um, the, this, com or this company really only hired these victims. Um, they provided individual counseling, group counseling. They picked them up from their homes, so they still lived in the community. Um, and they went home every day with dignity and with respect. Um, and it was it's rehab, really, too. Um, environment support group that was in Bangalore, they're doing um, social justice, but from a different angle. They're doing it with um, the environment in mind, but really because um, people are being um, exploited by that environmental, um, the way they're going about the environment. So this is an example. There was a farmer, this is from the environmental support group. There was a farmer, he couldn't, his crops weren't producing um, because the land had just, um, is just not fertile anymore. And so to pay off his debt, he told the city that they could come and dump trash on his site, on his land. Okay, well, since May of 2003, 200 truckloads have been coming and dumping on his land. But the problem with that much waste and not, like, there's no treatment, is all this waste, there's liquids and stuff, as well as a lot of toxic chemicals, and it pools into these, like, ponds. But they're not water. It's like... Um, it's causing like mental, uh, like physical disabilities in children. It's causing respiratory issues. It's causing um, like intestinal infections. It's causing diarrhea. It's causing sleeplessness. It's causing causing cough and respiratory tract infections. It's causing all these things, and these people are living amongst it, but they don't have health care. So it's like, <laughs> what do you do with that? Um, and this, it's like this kind of injustice isn't enforced, and it's. So the environmental support group is trying to come alongside and support because all, all the farmland around him has become, like, it's, it's not producing anything either. And so it's all become toxic, even though what, this trash is only on specifically his site. Does that make sense? Um, so they're trying to combat the environmental side because the people around him are being affected. Um, another thing is child labor, but um, one group, Maya um, organization, is working with. This was something that was really um, striking to me um, about the silk industry. Um, kids are the most popular. Kids are the most popular laborers in the silk industry. Um, to give you. For those of you that don't know, and I didn't know this before I went, um, silkworms eat mulberry leaves, and in order to get the silk out of these worms, they, they have to be boiled alive. So some people have an issue with that just in itself, is that you're boiling something alive. But um, the problem is, is that you have to take these worms and you have to string out the silk. And to do that, your hands need to be very gentle, and so they use children for this. Um, okay, so you're around boiling vats of hot water, you're in a dark environment, you're in very hot conditions, um, you have people that own you that are telling you to work faster, um, you have rapid moving looms that are stringing this, you have diesel fuel that is, using, that is you know, generating those looms to work, um, you're working for 12 to 16 hours a day, your hands are blistering from the boiling water, um, the dead, handling the dead worms though is causing infection and your hands are getting cut because of threads. Like, 
this is not okay. <laughs> this is not okay that this is happening in India. Um, for this reason, H&M does not buy any silk from India. Do not buy silk from India. <laughs> um, and it really puts in perspective, like, okay, when you see a woman wearing silk, how beautiful is that really? Like, the hands that made that silk, that pulled that silk out, um, are not hands that I won't touch in my clothes. So, this, that's just like an example, I guess, that I want people to be aware of, that their, what they buy is really just promoting, um, is promoting a, you know, a supply and demand market. So, <coughs> I got all worked up. Um, okay, so some of the things that I want to just tell one more story of when I was in um, Bangalore the last, about two weeks before I left, we went to Bangalore for our last excursion. And as we were walking down this main street, they had like a Tommy Hilfiger store, and there were like other stores that weren't as like nice, but it was like a nice street. Um, and there was a boy sitting there with his shirt off, and he'd been like severely burned. Well, first, having your shirt off is kind of like, hmm. I don't usually see that in India, but it's a man, so it's okay. Um, but he was probably like 12, I'm guessing, 11 or 12. And he's sitting on the ground, not looking at anyone, not didn't have his hands out, just sitting there, but his lap was full of money. And when I walked by, I just got fired up, and I was like, someone did that to him. Um, and in Bangalore and in the bigger cities, this crime is organized. He's under someone else who's under someone else who's under someone else that just exploits all these people and is just making money. And people will give him more money because he has these burns, because he looks poor, because they feel bad. And so this man above him, that's above him, that's above him, is making all this profit off of what he's done to this kid. Um, so anyways, I see this boy sitting on the ground. And I'm like, okay. I worked, um, part of my internship was working at this child line. And um, it's like a 911 call center 24 hours a day for children specifically. And if they need help, if they need counseling, if there's a child that's lost, if you see a child that's um, being exploited, you call them and they're supposed to come and rescue the child out and get them to where they need to go. Um, and so I called him and I was like, hey, like, there's this kid here on the street, we need you to come get him. And, he's, and they were like, well, no, 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 like, you need to have the police bring him to us. And I was like, okay, the police do not have my respect in India, but that's the system, then that's okay. I can, I can abide by that. So I, we go to lunch, and I called them when I was at lunch. So then I, um, when I, on my way back, I told the police off, the traffic officer, not the police officer, I was told afterwards, that this police, that this traffic officer, um, that there was a kid up the street, he needed you to take him to child line. And he's like, okay, you, you bring me to him. Okay, so I was like, yep, he's this way. So I come up there, the child's gone. And I was like, dang it. Okay, well, he's gone, like, and I was feeling bad that I kind of inconvenienced the officer. And then instead of facing the street, I faced the stores, and I looked straight in front of me, and in this cement um, stairway that was kind of like dark, I see the boy, and I see this older man counting all of his money. And I lost control, <laughs> I'll be honest. I started screaming on this main street, and of course, everyone gathers because it's the white American, and she's losing control. <laughs> They're staring at me anyway, and then when I start screaming, it just gives them all more reason to be intrigued. So I start yelling, that's the boy, arrest him, you need to arrest him, you need to take him to child line. And the police goes, it's okay, it's okay. I was like, are you kidding me right now? And um, yeah, so they didn't do anything. It was okay. He said, the, but don't, don't worry, the police officer told me that he told him not to do it again. Um, so, so that, I guess it is resolved. Um, so then we went to another police officer at the other side of the road and we were like, hey, you know what, this guy didn't do anything, did you see these guys? He's like, no, I didn't see them. And he's like, well, why didn't you take them? They wanted us 
to take this guy who was counting their money to the police station ourselves. That's what they asked us to do. Which, um, these criminals are controlling the government and are controlling the policemen, and if they're willing to pour boiling oil on this kid, they're not, res and they're not scared of killing me. Like, really, they're not. <laughs> and so I was putting myself in a very dangerous position, but um, it just kind of happened that way, and I couldn't contain myself. Anyways, um, that was Bangalore. So <laughs> that, but like the image of this kid like, is still with me. Um, and then that night, it was just like, okay, well, what I said to this guy, and this guy that I was like yelling like arrest him, <laughs> he was just terrified. He was just like completely, oh gosh, I don't know what he thought of, not <laughs> like them or something, I don't know what. <laughs> but he was, he was scared out of his butt, like scared out of his skin, and he just ran. Um, but I kept thinking, okay, what if I said that's going to, that's going to like incur or promote more um, more harm to this kid. Like, is he going to get beat tonight? Is he going to, um, you know, is he going to get his like eyes like burned out? Like, people do this, and um, people do it for money. And um, and when we were standing around this circle, one of my other friends was with me, and this kid, this other Indian guy goes. What, like what is like, what's going on? Because I was in the middle of this huge crowd, and she's like, "Well, this guy is like counting this kid's money and is taking it," and he's like, "Yeah, so what?" And he walked away. Like that's the root, like the mentality of so many people, and that's what makes people like walk across, like walk past this boy every day, like thousands of people, because people are just like, "Yeah, it happens." Yeah, so. Yeah, that's India. So one of the things that I really struggle with is like feeling very defeated, um, feeling that like here in America we feel like yeah one person can really make a difference, but um, there you don't feel so empowered, <laughs> and you do feel very very overcome with I can't really do anything because the police don't care. <laughs> The Indian people, a lot of them, no, nah, they don't care either. Um, so, yeah. Anyways, I don't know what else. Yeah. So I guess I just wanted to ask you guys if you had like further questions, if you want me to um, expound on anything. Or, yeah, there no questions. Okay, I'll just read something that I wrote. Um, I said, I can't give you um, what I really feel like, well, I can't really tell you how emotional or like um, what I felt like when I was there. Day-to-day um, -day life was very fun, it was adventurous, it was very frustrating at times. Um, it was almost always unexpected always chaotic. I was always in the spotlight. People would come up to me and take take out their camera phone and literally like two feet from my face just take a picture of me. And that's okay <laughs> for some reason. And I was like, why is this okay? And my Indian friend goes, there's no rule that it's not. And they're like, I guess, <laughs> I guess there's not a law that says you can't go up to people and just take a picture in their face. But anyways. <laughs> um, So I also, um, said it was very difficult inwardly, but outwardly I really enjoyed my time there. Um, I didn't foresee going back right when I came, because I, just like this whole sense of like, um, defeatment and, I don't know if that's a word, um, but just like, of what can I do? But, um, the going back doesn't seem so daunting anymore, and I have a sense that, well, something I'm, I believe is that the Indian people need to be burdened with the same um, burden for their own, their own country, for their own people. 
you know, we can't go in there with our expectations and with our um, view of how things should be done and change them. Like, that's not going to happen. They need to be convicted that, you know, this isn't okay. And it's not, I, I very much felt like it's a dog eat dog world. Like, take care of myself. I don't care if someone else is, you know, in the gutter. Like, I just got to take care of myself. And that was, um, I felt like that was a lot of the mentality um, of the Indian people. Um, yeah, Coca Cola is just, I'm going to start with Coca Cola. <laughs> Long story short, they tap the water, they put a pipe in the ground and drop the water levels so low, like six meters below where they used to be. And so crops just failed. And they did it for their own bottling purposes. So, um, and they use, what was the statistic? Shoot. They use, um, I think. They waste the amount, oh yeah, in one day they use the amount of drinking water the world needs, the whole world needs in a day. In one day, Coca-Cola uses that, that same amount of water. Shame on you, Coca-Cola. <laughs> yeah. Does anyone else have any further questions? Um, if you yeah. do go back to India, do you have any idea where you might locate yourself or what you might do? Um, no, I would probably work for an NGO. We saw a number of NGOs that weren't working well, and we saw a lot of NGOs that worked very well. Um, the ones I highlighted, I was really impressed with. Um, it might go, I might go back to do like rehab or work with um, women who have been victims of prostitution. Um, when I was there, I felt like you know, it's a supply-demand market. If one girl comes out, another girl's going in. Um, and I really struggled with that. Like, okay, well, we need to get at the supply, like, or we need to get at the demand issue, and we need to educate men that that's not okay, that what they're doing is a crime. Um, and I spoke about that with one of our friends back home, and um, he'd been in India, too, and he goes, Andy, you can't think like that. You have to think on the individual. Like for that individual, you're you're changing their life, and you're, um, and you can't you can't think. Well, what's the use? So, um, but not. I don't know if I'll necessarily go back for that. But it is a very, um, a very tough a tough field to go into because these brothel owners are just like the criminals that I experienced and they're willing to kill. And the police are willing to sell your name if you turn them in. So, Josh? Um, I was just thinking, you were talking a lot in your, in your story about the boy mm -hmm. and how the crowd really didn't care much. Um, and that their worldview was that this is what happens. Mm -hmm. um, what do you do you think that that might have something to do with their view, their, the majority world view of uh, karma, and that this kid might have deserved it from something, or uh, he was born that way, that's why he deserved it, and that's more of their world view, so it's more accepted, um, versus maybe a world view of your own that might see every individual person as something who has value or should be exploited. Um, I think there may be some truth to that. Um, I guess I can't really answer it because I'm not, I'm not educated very much in Hinduism and um, the whole karma and reincarnation. I'm in a class right now and we're doing karma this week actually, but um, it's so, it's so, um, it's something that I'm just not well versed in. So. I think if it was their kid, they'd say, no, that's not okay. But since it's someone else's kid, it's, it's okay. But at the same time, you have men that are dads that sell their girls off all the time. So, for whatever that's worth, I guess. Yeah. I don't know whether you observed it, but did you notice any distinction between Hindus and Muslims that are treatment of women? Um, yep. Um, I don't
don't know if it's necessarily a distinction between Hindus and Muslims, but um, one of the NGOs that we had an internship at um, was solely for women's empowerment and doing, um, like, no, what's the called? Just like forming groups and like everyone puts in, you know, so much money every month and then after a year, one lady will take out a loan and like start something and then like they all keep doing that. Micro lending. Yeah, micro lending. So it definitely is an issue, um, but I don't know if it's necessarily between because of their religion. Typically, um, I was in a small I was in a smaller city, and women were expected to be at home, and you never saw women out at night hardly. So our friends need to be home by six thirty. Which is why I'm happy that I didn't have a home stay after I got there. Because that, yeah, I wouldn't have had the support at home, nor would have I had any of the freedom. So. Annie, did you find yourself connected to the community there? Not just your American friends, but did you get included um, in weddings and activities? And I I went to one wedding. Um, it was always like, yeah, if you want to come, yeah, you come. It was never like, yes or no. It was like, yeah, it's okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> well, <laughs> I don't know. It was very frustrating at times because you could never get a de definite answer. But people did, like, watch out for us. And, like, on the streets, um, they'd be like, where's your friend? <laughs> well, your friend just went home. Oh, well, good. <laughs> Thank you for keeping an eye on all of us. <laughs> um, <laughs> <laughs> so, <coughs> I had this guy the last week come up to me on the street, and he goes, "You, I'd never seen him before. Don't know who he is. Just walking on the street, coming back from school. You leave Saturday, right?" <laughs> <laughs> yes, I do. <laughs> I do leave on Saturday. <laughs> Informing me that everyone knows my plans. <laughs> so. It was a small community of people living in this city. Yeah, the city. and we walked on the same street, went to the school. Um, we walked the same path every day, so, and there were five white people. Um, I think I saw maybe three white people in the city while I was there, so, and when we saw white people, we were staring at them. <laughs> so now we, we really understood why people are really so interested in our colors. <laughs> yeah. Okay, I have two questions. Did you meet any Christians at all while you were there? Uh-huh. Okay. Lots of Christians. That live there. Mm -hmm. Okay. The southern part is, um, there's a lot of Catholicism, so most of the Christians that you meet will be Catholic, um, but not all. I went to a couple evangelical churches. The percentage, if you think about, like, general population, <laughs> it's very small, but there are, there are few Christians. Right? And the school is Catholic that she oh, was attending. Okay. And did you feel in danger very often? I know in the, with the boy incident you did, but other yeah. than that, did you? Um, I lived conservatively. Um, one of my friends liked to talk to every stranger on the road, just, you know, strike up a conversation, tell her about her life. And I was very much like, <laughs> I am going to just kind of like stay in my little world, which I think um, held me back in many ways. But even doing that, I had a couple instances of when guys were following us. So, um, yeah, you don't, I did, you know, you never know who's watching you. And because of how many people there are, there's a lot of people actually watching you. And, like, guys boarding trains um, after us, like, people that would stay up, like, we would switch shifts so that someone was always up. So bags when it gets stolen and stuff like that. You just, like you have to be careful. You definitely can't just like, oh, I'm gonna travel India by myself and be a woman and go where I want. It's like you get in a rickshaw and the guy just drives around the city if you don't know where you're going and you're not assertive. And then he drops you off and you're like, no, this is where I go, where I want to go. Yeah, it's okay. No, actually, it's not okay. And I'm not gonna give you <laughs> all this money that you're trying to scam me out of. So you're definitely taken advantage of. Um, and 
you need to, yeah, and I don't even know how many times I was taking advantage of, I'm sure. <laughs> Maybe every day. Many know English, apparently. You could speak. The educated do. Um, one of the one of the last weeks I was there, I was getting sugar cane juice, which is this green sludge drink, <laughs> just so delicious. Um, and he asked me if I was taking the bus back to America. So um, he spoke a little English, but he obviously wasn't very educated. <laughs> Well, thank you guys for, yeah. What was the traffic like in Mangalore? Because I know traffic in the big cities is kind of outrageous. So. Yeah, um, it's still like, it's, it's still crazy. It's not, um, I didn't go to any of the big cities kind of out of fear. <laughs> um, like we practice crossing the street, so. Yeah. Like I was one time I was walking and I was carrying a plastic bag and a rickshaw was driving and it hit my bag. Like that's how close he came to me. And I realized not till afterwards that I didn't even like flinch. Like you yeah. <laughs> yeah, we didn't get that. Close. I went with a faculty group, and we didn't get the walking across the street orientation. Yeah. And one of our faculty got hit by uh, a, a motorcycle. Yeah. And that was pretty traumatic for her. After they had been in the hospital for two days with the, the normal thing you get from eating, mm -hmm. not eating right. So there was a couple of rough days in there. Yeah. We, we should have had the orientation for crossing the street. Mm -hmm. That's helpful. <laughs> it's India. It's crazy. Yeah. So. Great. Well, thanks, guys.